We definitely see that investors are getting more cautious. I wouldn't say that they get risk averse, but they definitely get more risk conscious. And we are seeing actually a number of points that have increased the, uh, the risks out there, both from the economic policy side as well as from the geopolitical side. And that could actually add some uncertainty to the overall positive picture that we still see uh, from the macro side and from the interest rate side. So yes, definitely more uncertainty around and also that for the second half of the year in general. So what are the big challenges then for you? The big challenges, uh, just to start with, are uncertainties about uh, trade, uh, trade tariffs, trade war, if you like, more escalation likely until at least until the midterm elections in the United mm -hmm. States on the 6th of November. Uh, lots of uncertainty around uh, those companies exposed to global trade. Uh, second risk that is going to come later this summer is probably going to be Italy. Uh, the budget draft that is going to be presented and under the, the European semester it's going to be presented to Brussels before it's finally passed in the Italian Parliament and that is going to create trouble because it, Italy wants to spend a lot more money mm. that it obviously doesn't have. Then there is a number of other risks around including the Brexit and also uncertainties around the Middle East. So there is a lot, lot of uh, uh, possible escalation points uh, on the plate. Let, let's just go back to Italy, because last time you were on the programme, you really kind of said that this was a make-or-break moment for yeah. Italy. Do you still believe that, given what's now happening with Brexit? Well, I think it's, it's, it's two different angles of the same story, but we are, we are actually talking about a weakening of the European setup altogether. And what is going to happen in Italy is that there will be some escalation of fears that there could be a breakup. Eventually, there will be no breakup. Uh, because the political capital invested in the euro is far too high. Um, whereas with Brexit, it's, it's, a, it's a story that really nobody had on its radar screen for some months, and now it's coming back. With and it's coming back with a vengeance. It Isn't is. this the point, though, that you know nobody kind of expected this turn? Uh, two resignations in a matter of hours this week. I mean, is that really going to change how investors are thinking? Are they going to start taking their money out of the UK? Um, I think, you know, we're, um, and, and that, is, that is sort of um, a paradox, because last week it seemed that Mrs May had won and, you know, won the, the, her, op, uh, her vision of a soft Brexit. Now, after the, after the departures from her government, it seems like there is a big rupture going th right through the Tory party, and it's far from, uh, from certain that uh, the, um, the, the lower house will actually approve uh, the Brexit, uh, the, the, the exit agreement. And that will need to come, it needs to be ready by October uh, because, because it needs to be ratified in 27 other European countries before the exit date of the 29th of March next mm -hmm. year. So now that more and more investors are seeing that time is running out and that, um, and that it's actually very unlikely that a, um, a solid solution can be found by October or let's say November at the latest, uh, investors will start withdrawing money from the UK. I mean, this really is just showing how uncertain uh, everything really is mm. geopolitically right now. I mean, going back to the trade war, is that still as much of a player these days when we have so many other things going on? <laughs> right, it's, 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 it's a, it's it's a topic that... It's difficult to know where to focus. Absolutely. This, this topic has definitely taken a back seat, as you, as you were saying mm. before. But I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. The thing is that we probably end up with lower tariffs. It, it seems, it seems a, a, another paradox, but it actually I think that uh, Mr. Trump needs a sounding board for his election campaign, and he, and he knows that this, this trade thing, that the notion of, or, the, or the, the idea that the US is being treated in an unfair way in international trade, that is resonating very well with his electorate. So as long as this election campaign goes, he needs to step up his rhetoric and become even more aggressive, and after that, we will probably see a deal with, which might involve lower tariffs. But at the same time, as this trade war or threat of a trade war continues, uh, the United States is pushing ever closer to a potential recession. Is that fair? Um, it's, not, it's not pushing closer to recession. Right now, the, the US economy is steaming ahead. Actually, growth will probably come in close to 3%, mm -hmm. uh, partly on the back of the tax cuts that were introduced earlier this year. So we see that CapEx is actually uh, taking hold, that uh, households are ready to spend more. So we probably see a big impact on growth uh, this year. Of course, it brings the American economy closer to a tipping point, And the room that it has to run is shorter after the tax reform. Uh, so, uh, having said that, this is not a problem for the second half this year. It's probably uh, a problem for the period beyond that in 2019 and, and beyond. And, and at some stage, the US economy will slow because the impact, um, the flash in the pan effect from the tax reform will run out. So, we talked 
a lot about how the, what the challenge is uh, for the second half of 2018. What are the drivers of the economy, do you think, coming for us? Well, actually, we, we see one of the potential catalysts in the reporting season that is about to start very soon. And, you know, I think that companies are still pretty positive on the back of pretty solid growth uh, in the world and interest rates remaining very low. So if you use interest rates as a discount factor for future earnings, that is actually something that can make equity markets look much more attractive uh, throughout the second half this year and even beyond. And actually, this could, could create the room for maneuver that equity prices need against the backdrop of all these risks that we've been talking about. So the positive backdrop actually comes from solid growth in the combination with still very low interest rates. So you are you on balance positive about the second half of this year then? We are, we are indeed. Not quite as positive though as we were in the, in the first half. And we've seen that we've got quite some headwinds both to both components of the Goldilocks scenario. Growth uh, regarding the Trump uh, trade scenario and interest rates regarding an overheating risk to the US economy. So both of these um, components of Goldilocks have been pulled into question the first half. And uh, so we're not as positive as we were in the past, but we're still positive on balance. I just wanted to bring IPOs up for a moment. We've been discussing this uh, quite a bit on the programme this week. Um, today we talked about Xiaomi on the Hang Seng. It opened poorly yesterday, it's doing better today. But there's been a couple here in Switzerland this week. One was postponed, another one opened fairly flat. And I'm just wondering if there's a little bit of a trend here. Before the financial crisis, we saw a lot of IPOs kind of heading this way. Do you think this is a potential indicator of something untoward? In the, econ in the economic outlook? It's definitely one of many indicators that we, <laughs> need, that we need to look at. And actually, if you look at, uh, of course, there is more ups and downs, there is more volatility. And by definition, uh, the, the, the change between good times to place an IPO and not so good times change more rapidly. So the intervals become shorter. And this mm -hmm. is, of course, um, if you see volatility rising, this is, this is a reflection of the greater uncertainty that we see amongst investors. So, uh, I mean, the uh, the... IPOs being postponed, etc., is just a consequence. It's and, and it's it's a symptom, but it's not the reason. But it, does it show that you know in, investors are less willing to put their money just anywhere? They are being a lot more selective now. They, they are becoming a lot more selective. You can see that in other pockets of the risk parts of mm -hmm. the markets, for example, that investors are also becoming more selective about emerging markets. That mm -hmm. they ju just need, want to know where where do we put our money, and that is definitely a sign of more selectiveness, and by that more also more nervousness in the market. Okay, so given what we've just talked about, how should uh, investors build their portfolios? We still believe that they should be overweight equities, but more selectively though, again, more selective, and um, put a greater weight on, on those um, regions where growth is more likely to come from. That is, we overweight the United States, whereas we underweight Europe at this stage. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we also prefer quality stocks and those stocks that probably will outperform in a downturn. And you've also pulled out um, of uh, a few companies um, or reduced your exposure, certainly BlackRock's reduced its exposure to some of the companies here in Switzerland. Is that part of that plan weighting more heavily towards the US? That's right. That's also that's also due to, to the fact that we want to be uh, overweight in the US and underweight Europe at this stage. We're all, we, we, but on the, on the risk part of the, of the equity game, for example, we remain overweight emerging markets, whereas we have downgraded Japan slightly to neutral from overweight. Okay, Martin, look, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.